gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. Yes. Amen. And when the Holy Ghost fell, the Bible says that it was like, like tongues of fire that set upon yes. each of them. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost this morning? Amen. It is available today. It will make a difference in your life. Amen. The Bible says that that promise is to you. It's to your children. It's to all that are far off. Even as we as the Lord our God shall call. Amen.
seated if you'd like to. Sister Bailey is going to come and sing for us. Amen. We're so glad to have Joseph with us this morning. Yes, yes, yes. It's good to see Tracy here today. And really, Kenny, we're glad you're here. Amen. We're just glad to be in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's worship with Sister Bailey.
it says it's not like his. His are much higher than ours. Yeah. But we have to trust him. We have to walk by faith. Amen. Thank God. Praise the Lord. We're going to have Sister Lee who's going to come and sing for us. I want you to bring your grandkids with you this morning. We're going to let them sing also. I was thinking about that while I was just saying that, you know, it doesn't matter your age. You could be a little child. Amen. God loves you. You could have walked with God for many years until you're like Sister Lee and your hair is changed to a different color than what it was in your youth. Amen. But God still loves you. Amen. We all have a soul, praise God, and they all are equal in value to the Lord. Amen. It's society that determines or tries to put a price or measure of worth on people as to what they've gained or what they've accomplished. But that's not the way it is in God's economy. In God's economy, everybody has a soul, and they're all of equal value. Aren't you thankful for that? Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's worship with these ladies as they say.
Sister Betty and Sister Linda are going to come and sing for us. So we want them to come right over. Praise the Lord. Brother Rick, would you mind to stand and testify while they're getting ready? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I appreciate the Lord today. I like to thank everyone for the past year of giving that you gave since I'm kind of responsible for the treasury part. As of yesterday, every year, our annual insurance comes due <coughs> for the church. And uh, I kind of just bypassed everything. And several months ago, I just started putting some of the cash offerings back. And so I just paid the insurance. And usually, we have to take a special offering. You don't have to do that this year. And I, I try to pray that God blesses everything that's given. Yes, yes the Lord. Amen. Amen. There's a there's a financial responsibility that sometimes you wonder where where where's it come from. The Lord said, "I own the cattle on a thousand." Yes. 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 Why? One man in the Bible owed some taxes. A fish came up, deposited the money. Yes. Now, ain't that something? Yes. Isn't it something that the Lord can provide just when you need it? Yes. Right on time. Amen. Something Brother Jamie said brought to memory something in the Bible. The Bible said, make it not strange the fiery trial of your faith said, I have chosen you out of a furnace of affliction. Yes, amen. I have refined you till you're so precious that the reflection is like a mirror. Yes. 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 The only way God finds out what's deep inside you is to put you in a place where you've never been before. Yes. 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 To refine you, to bring you the, the very best that's inside out. Right. Man, I look around and I see beautiful people. And there's a lot of them out there. But you know what I see? Is I see those people that are walking around that are shining lights in a very dark world. Yeah, hallelujah. The church is about to be. The Bible said that he would present a glorious church. Yes. And Isaiah said after he said that the, the, the People are covered with darkness and the earth is covered with gross darkness. But he said, my, rock, my light is about to shine upon me. My glory is about to rise. Get ready, church. Get ready, church, for the most glorious time the church has ever seen. The glory of God is going to be our ministry. We're in a place, Pastor Dixon, where God wants to glorify this time. I see it every day. I see it every week that we come together that God is beginning to draw. That magnetic pull. Hallelujah. I'm anxious to hear these two sisters sing. We haven't heard them in a long time. Oh, My Lord, let's worship with them. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 let's yes, worship yes. with them.
your name, God, today. Thank the Lord. You got your Bibles, so let's turn to Romans chapter number 7. And I'm going to read from verse number 18. Good to have Joseph with us this morning. Praise the Lord, Tracy, and everybody else in the house of the Lord. Yes. I'm yeah. so glad that you are here today. Romans chapter number 7. Verse number 18, the Bible says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It's verse number 24 I really want to get to. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Praise the Lord. God bless you. You can be seated. Now let me go over that one more time. And I want us to understand that when Paul is talking about for that, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil, which I would not, that I do. That he's not talking about, referring to, or suggesting that while he is a preacher of the gospel and an apostle of the Lamb, that at the same time, he is a wicked, evil man. That's not what he's talking about. It relates to that situation in the garden in Matthew 26 when the disciples had fallen asleep and when Jesus found them in that condition, he said, the spirit is willing, but it's the flesh that, that, is, that is weak. Yes. It's more along those lines. That's more what he's talking about. He's referring to, and the scripture certainly fits from Psalms chapter number 51, when David said that I was shapen in iniquity. I was born into this thing. I was born into sin. He said it was in sin that my mother conceived me. Right. That's what he's referring to. It's it's the flesh. It's this uh, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The Bible says that these two are contrary one to the other. Yes. Does it mean that while he's preaching the gospel at the same time he's found a law that allows him to sin? He's just referring and he says it plainer in some other places where he says I keep my body under Bring it into subjection, lest at any time after I have preached to others, I myself might become a castaway. He's talking about the continual warfare that goes on between our flesh and between the spirit. Even when the spirit, and he acknowledges in this setting of scripture, the spirit is tempted to do right. I always have got this flesh that I have got to contend with. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're good to us, God. We worship you. We bless the name of the Lord this morning. We implore God. We pray this morning, Jesus, that the Spirit of God would help us 
through the next few minutes, Lord. The noise, God, touch us all to speak, but also to hear, to receive the engrafted word that is able to save a soul. Hallelujah. Praise God. In Jesus' name. So after he explains those things or goes through that, gets to verse number 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who? He never said what. He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's in that same book of Romans. What a book it is. It's in that same book of Romans, the same writing of Paul. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 2. Paul talks about being not conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you read that scripture by itself, you didn't realize some other things that are written in Scripture that might become, or they might come just a big question mark. Or the Apostle instructs us not to be conformed to a worldly system or worldly values, but rather being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there possibly could be a huge question that could come into our minds. How, pray tell, how exactly is that accomplished? How does one do that? The apostle of the Bible instructs us <clears throat> but to be transformed, then how exactly do I go about being transformed? In Romans chapter number 7, Paul is saying that in my flesh, I know that in my flesh that there is no good thing. Hallelujah. I know where he's simply saying modern day language that we maybe can understand better. He said, I, I know where, I understand where the problem is at. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There is an old, it's what's called an old Negro spiritual came out of some of those old black churches I don't know how long ago. I've noticed that black preachers, black folks, they have a way of saying things very simply that I can understand. Yes. And they have a song that they used to sing. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. Yeah, right. Standing in the need of prayer. Right. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. Yeah. But it's me, oh Lord. It's not my father. It's not my mother. And they're simply saying and singing about the same thing that Paul wrote. That I understand where the problem is at. Right. And the problem is in this flesh. Paul says that in me, that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. Hallelujah. I am in dire need yes. of something Hallelujah. that will change me. Right. Praise yeah. God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, wretched man that I am. Hallelujah. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Right. Praise God. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you know that there are there are a lot of things that we can be taught. The mind is, is an incredibly powerful thing. There are a lot of things that we can be taught. I can be taught to have a positive mental attitude. I can learn that. I can be taught that. As a matter of fact, I have read books about how to have a positive attitude. I think having a positive attitude is a good thing. To a certain point, I think it's a good thing. I have heard messages preached and have preached them myself of how to have a positive attitude in a negative world. 
I can learn how to do that. I can be taught that. The mind is powerful. It's a powerful thing. I can learn how to be very upbeat. And I'm not saying that there's something wrong with being upbeat or having a positive mental attitude. I like to be around people that are upbeat, don't you? Yes. I like to be around positive thinking people. I enjoy that. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's effective. We can learn those things. Praise the Lord. But deep down inside, even though I've got a good attitude, even though I am very upbeat, even though I have learned how to be positive in a negative world, even though I can pick out the good things in life, leave the bad things alone, focus on those things which are good. I can know that. I can learn every bit of that. I can practice it every day. But deep down inside of me, I can still have that basic problem that the number one thing in my life is finding what pleases me above everything else. I'm looking for what pleases me, what I like. And in that, in that lies the problem that's in my flesh. I need something, just like Paul's talking about. I need something that will change me. Amen. in dealing with people for a long time now, I've realized that the bottom line is people are going to do what they want to do. Right. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Years ago, I quit doing a premarital council. I stopped doing that because I realized it's a waste of time. It don't matter. You have, you have a couple of young people that come to you and they're asking, you, Pastor, we're thinking about getting married. What do you think? I came to realize pretty quickly that it didn't matter what I thought. <laughs> they want to get married? Honey, they're going to get married. And it don't matter... <laughs> I, I've never, I've never done it. I've, I've never looked at somebody and said, "Are you out of your mind? <laughs> you want to marry him? <laughs> what in the world is wrong with you?" I've never done that. There's been a couple of times I wanted to, but I realized that it did not. They had their minds made up. This counseling session is totally a waste of time. I stopped doing it years ago. Because the bottom line is, people are going to do what they want to do. Yes. My marriage counseling has been more when she's sitting that on end of the couch and he's sitting on that end of the couch and they won't talk to each other. And I've been involved in some of those. The people, for the most part, they do what? The bottom line is they're going to do Amen. what they want to do. Uh, and they're looking for what pleases them. Over the years, I've had, I've had people before, I had to uh, talk to them about church or invite them to church, or sometimes I didn't even invite. Sometimes, sometimes they were the ones that brought up the questions and, and uh, began to question me on them before I ever said anything. But I've had, people, I've had people before say, well, what kind of music you got in your church? How loud is it? And what they're basically saying is, am I going to hear what I want to hear? That, that basically is it. I've had people to ask me that before. And then when I tried to answer, they would tell me what they like. And that's okay. I don't mind an opinion. I've had people before, and I've talked to them about coming to church. They want to know, what do you have a nursery in your church? Do you... Now... The nursery in your church, can, can I take my children to that nursery?
nursery before church starts? Can I just, when I get there, can I just take them in there? And I can just leave them in there and I don't have to worry about them until they have the church. I've had those questions come up. Do you, it's very important to me that the church that I attend has a nursery in it. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. <laughs> what kind of youth group do you have? In your church now, do you have a lot of activities for your youth? Do, do they do they get to do a lot of things? I mean, is there a lot of you know, there's a lot of activities, a lot of stuff going on? It's very important to me. I have I have teenagers, and do you? And then they would ask about the preaching. Hallelujah! And I would tell them we have the best preaching in our church that you're going to find on the face of the earth. Amen. You just can't find it better anywhere. But they ask about the preacher. Well, how, I've had, I've actually had people ask me, well, how long does it last usually? <laughs> and I always lie to them about that. But anyway, what is, what's the preaching like? Um, he said, we don't want, I don't like to hear a lot of negative stuff. I don't, I, I don't want to, I, I, you know, I just, uh, what, what is your preaching like? And, 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 and I've been asked that. And, and what about your church? I want to be comfortable. And, and what about your Sunday school? And, and another thing, do you serve snacks? I've actually had this question. Do you, do you serve snacks in your Sunday school? Are the kids going to get some snacks while they're in there? And, and, and all, all these questions over the years have, have come up. I don't think I have ever had anybody that asked about the church, somebody that I would invite, or somebody that brought the questions up on, the, or on their own. I don't think I, I know I have. In fact, I've never had anybody ask me, I want to know something. Can your church and can your pastor, can the ministry in the, your church, can they teach me how to mortify the flesh? And the deeds of the flesh. Because you see, there's something I understand. I've got a problem. Praise the Lord. And the problem is me. And I want to know right. if I can find Come something on. in your church that can do something about the problem that I have in this flesh. That's the Lord. Paul says in 
You live after the flesh, you'll die. Ain't that cheerful preaching? But he said, through the Spirit. And that's not the human spirit. But through the Spirit, if we do mortify the deeds of the body, we shall live. Yes. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, well, I'll tell you something. That book of Romans is a tough book. Or at least them two or three chapters. <laughs> I think I'm just going to stay away from that book of Romans. I think if I go to church somewhere and that's what the preacher's preaching, I'm going to find me a different church. Come on, folks. Amen. That's human thinking. We like what pleases us. Romans is tough. It didn't take me but just a little bit of reading in the book of Romans to understand that the book of Romans does not support my casual approach to living for God. Right, amen. amen. It don't. Amen. It talks about all that mortifying stuff. Hallelujah. Yeah. The stuff I don't, uh, I don't really like the book of Romans. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Naaman the leper, he didn't like what the prophet Elisha had to say either. Right. 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 He didn't like the instructions of dipping seven times in Jordan to get rid of his leprosy. Yeah. He didn't like that. Right. right. He had a, a better plan. He thought he had an idea that pleased him more. Right. And he didn't really like what Elisha had to say. Right. And thus saith the word of God. Go right. get seven times in Jordan and you'll be healed. He didn't necessarily like that. But I want to tell you something, folks. He had a need. He right. needed to be changed. Hallelujah. Something needed to be changed. Whatsoever. The Bible never, never pictured Esau. 
saw as a heel grab, like he did his brother Jacob. That was not just trying to get home more all the time of what he had, but Jacob was after things that were not rightfully his. But the Bible never says that of Esau. But one of the things it did say that caused a lot of concern, a lot, maybe some confusion, but the Bible does make the statement, God said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And I've always wondered how in the world God could hate anybody. You know what I think, folks? I think it was his approach. I think it was his his value or lack of value that he put on godly things. Right. I think that was where the, the real problem was at. Because you know the story of Esau selling a birthright. Actually the most valuable thing he had. He sold it and sold it real cheap. Then he missed out on the Father's blessing. Right. He, missed, he missed that also. But I want you to notice something in the life of Esau. After he had sold his birthright, after he no longer had the Father's blessing, Esau did not seek out a corner somewhere and just lay down and die. No, he didn't. Esau not only built a home, Esau built a dynasty. He never just built a house, he built cities. He didn't just have a family. The whole tribe of Edom came from the loins of Esau. And he was a wealthy, wealthy man. So wealthy, in fact, that when Jacob, his brother, was coming home from Uncle Laban's house with all the things that God had blessed him with, when he sent out gifts to his brother Esau, Esau sent word to him and told him, I don't need any of that stuff. I've got all I could ever possibly want. He had so much that he didn't even want the gifts that Jacob had sent to him. He had made a life for himself. He was blessed. Whether or not he was blessed of God, I'll leave that up to your interpretation. But he was certainly blessed of worldly goods. He was a blessed man. But he had done it all without God in his life. What I'm saying is, my Lord, you can obtain Riches, right. fame, right. wealth, prestige, education, wisdom, knowledge. You can have it all. But what I'm saying this morning is none of that is going to do what desperately needs to be done in my life. None of that is going to change me. I still have the question in my mind. Who shall deliver me from the body of this The planter. His name actually meant that. Old Testament times a name was not just a name. It indicated the personality and the attitude of the person that it was applied to. And Jacob certainly lived up to his name, the supplanter. And while those things were not said about Esau, it's Jacob was the hill grabber. Jacob was the one, the one that wanted to possess the things that were not rightfully his. It was Jacob that was after. How in the world could Jacob be the one to have his name changed to Israel and become now a prince with God and have 12 children that founded 12 tribes of Israel and still call after the name of Jacob to this very day? I'll tell you how it happened because there was a time when Jacob came before and said, it's me, it's me, it's yes. me, oh Lord. Hallelujah. And in the need of something, I need Hallelujah. something that will change me. Oh Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want 
tell you something, folks. Saul of Tarsus, same way. The man that wrote the book of Romans, he was the same way. Acts chapter number 9. The experience with the Lord that changed him. Yes. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something, folks. There is nothing in formal religion that can change anybody. Right, right. It's lifeless. It has no power. Amen. And I want you to know this also. That I'm not pointing a finger at any denomination or any church. I'm just saying there's nothing in simply going through the motions of having church right. that's going to save anybody. Yes. Or change anybody. Right. It's lifeless. It has no power. And I'm not pointing a finger at anybody because there is quite are quite a few casual Christians that are a part of Pentecostal churches as well. Right. Amen. Y'all all right? Praise yes. the Lord. Did that shock your sensibilities this morning? That we have in Pentecost, we have our own casual Christians as well right. that just go through the motions of having church that are never changed, yes. that leave the same way they were when they came in. Praise God. Right. I want to tell you something, folks. And, and, and it, it, it's, a little, it's a little personal here, but it's okay, I think. I think it'll be all right. Um, my grandson Ethan's not here this morning. Uh, he is, he's going to church in Bentonville. And he came like a man. He came to talk to me about that. His parents never said anything about it. He, he came himself. And, and he talked to me. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing. And the reason I do is because for 19 years, he has been in his grandpa's church. And he needs to get out and see how things are done in some other churches. Right. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Nope. But when he talked to me, I told him, I said, well, Ethan, I want to tell you something. Your parents that have raised you right, raised you in church, and your pastor that's done his best to preach to you the truth. Those parents and that pastor can only take you so far. Amen. You have got to do this thing yourself. Amen. Praise God. Right. Thank Amen. the Lord Amen. that there are godly parents. Yes. Thank the Lord that there are pastors and preachers that yet Preach the truth. Thank right. yeah. God for it. Right. But if you don't have the want to, That's it, right. Right. Yeah. nobody is going to be able to give you the want to. Yes. You've got to have that for yourself. Right. Yes. You don't want to change, honey. There's not a preacher. There's not a church. Even God himself cannot change you if you don't want to. That's the only thing to do that can do it. My Lord, I can go the whole yes. house. Only, only a relationship with God. That's the only thing that can make a change. Praise yes. God. 
Hallelujah. The Pharisees didn't like Jesus. They really didn't like him. He came into a world that was a religious world, but it was a formal religious world. There wasn't any blinded eyes being opened down at the Pharisee church. There wasn't any Pharisees. They weren't raising the dead and they weren't cleansing lepers. They were going through the formalities. But the formalities do not have the power yes. to change anybody. Yes. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? Amen. It is relationship with the Almighty. That's the only thing that's going to change anybody. Amen. They yes. preach it some more. Yes. Relationship with the church won't do it. Right. Relationship with the pastor won't do it. Right. You might even be teaching a Sunday school class. That won't do it. If a church is doing what it's supposed to do, it's going to bring people in relationship with God. Not bringing people in relationship with God, it is a dismal failure. Right, because relationship is the only thing that makes a difference. Right, right, amen. That's the reason that women with bad attitudes, that were possessed and bad reputations, that were possessed with seven devils, when they came in relationship with Jesus. Yes. I'm talking about Mary Magdalene. Right. She was one that came to the tomb. She had a relationship with him. Yes. Praise right. God. Yes. That's what made the difference in her life. Right. That's the reason that when Zacchaeus got down out of that tree, and Jesus went home with him, that old Zacchaeus got so excited, he said, if I've taken anything but for some kind of false measures, I'm going to give back twice that. Praise God. Right. Something about relationship. Relationship is the only thing that will do it. Right. Yes. Amen. Psalms chapter 17, David, David made a statement in that chapter. He said, I'll be satisfied, Lord, when I'll wait in your likeness. I always took that as a statement, perhaps it is, but you read that whole chapter, Psalm 17, it's a prayer. So, I think maybe more along the lines of this is what I want. I, I hope this is what I'm praying for. This is the only thing that's going to satisfy me is awaken your likeness. Hallelujah. Then, only then I'll be satisfied. Praise God. From the third chapter of the book of Malachi, God makes a statement. I read it lots of times. You have to. In that statement, he simply says, I am the Lord, I change not. Yes. Even though we live in a time when it's not just our time, but we live in a time when people are really trying to get him to change. <laughs> but he won't. Right. Even though we live in a time when there's plenty of stuff that there are folks hoping he will overlook, he won't. If you never overlooked it in scripture, he's not going through now because I am the Lord. I change not. Yes. Usually, and if, if we mention that in preaching or whatever, you usually stop right there. I'm the Lord, I change not. Yeah. And thank the Lord. And we relate that to the words of the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today forever. Usually we leave it at that. But in Malachi chapter number 3, that's not all that scripture. The rest of it says, Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jacob, Israel. That's what the Bible's talking about. It's not just talking about those 12 sons of Jacob. It's talking about Israel. The whole nation, the whole tribe, the whole thing. Not consumed because God does not change. Not only relates to them, it relates to all of us too. That's right. We're not consumed because God does not change. Oh, yeah. 
We better thank the Lord that he has yes. not changed. Yes. Right. Amen. Amen. That he's the same as he ever was. Yes. Whatever he did, he still does. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hallelujah. How in the world people ever come to the conclusion that things that God did in the Bible, he no longer does. Right. In light of scripture, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not <coughs> consumed. Right. Or in other words, the only hope that the sons of Jacob had was the fact that God does not change. The only hope that Israel had is the fact that God is always the same. The only hope that any of us had, God does not change. Yes. Right. If he was a hearer, he still is a hearer. Yes. Right. I got scripture for that. God has not changed. If he ever was a miracle worker, if he could ever cause meal barrels not to run out, he could raise dead children back to life, and he could cast out devils, even though there were legion of them present, if he could ever do it, he could still do it. Because he does not change. Praise God. Thank you, yes. Hallelujah. If people could ever feel the presence of the Lord to the point that they said, didn't our hearts burn within us right. while we were in the way with Him? That is still true now. Yes. Still do those exact same things. You could ever slay giants, bring down walls, cause waters to back up, make a way where there was no way. You still can. If he could ever change life. If he could ever change a life. If he could ever cause a lady that was like the rest of us, born into sin, shaping in iniquity. Sure. Her life was totally carnal. If he could ever just just a little while in his presence and she goes running into the city with a message. Come see a man. Yeah. Told me everything that I have ever done. Sure, <coughs> this is the Messiah. Yeah. If he could ever change life, he still can. You see, the Lord is able to bless. Thank the Lord for the blessings yes. of God. Amen. God is a prayer answering yes, God. Amen. Now, let's get real honest for a minute. God has answered prayer to people I have known. That it was no doubt in my mind that it was God. It had to be God. This could not have worked out any other way. They never got out of the hospital or whatever if it had not been for God. Yes. Yes. God has answered prayer for people that I have known that I wondered, why in the world did you do that? Right. Ain't nobody else going to be honest. <laughs> Except for one thing, he's God and he knew what he wants to. Yes. Yeah, amen. Amen. But God is able to bless. He does those things and he answers the prayer. And he's the Lord, he never changes. But what I want to get to is this the number one priority of God is the salvation of the soul. Amen. Above the healing, above the miracles, above everything yes. else. Yes. The number one priority of God. Is the salvation yes. of the soul. Hallelujah. Who shall deliver me from the body of this? Yes. There's only one that can. His name is Jesus. And 
folks, I want us as a church to have the attitude that God, you are welcome here. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You might not be welcome in government, but you are welcome yes. here. You might not be welcome in our school system. Jesus to be welcome. I want you to be welcome in my church, in my home, in my heart, in my life. I want you to feel welcome. I want you to feel welcome enough that you are welcome to make changes. Let's get around the front church. Can we come? We're going to pray this morning. 